I'll wait till people's um, audio is connecting real quick. That's gone. I haven't even said anything. Come back. Let them off already. Hi, everyone who's joining us. Um, you obviously might have realized that you can't speak, um, but there is a chat box here, so please feel free to use it. Um, drop any questions in. If you can't hear us, let us know. Um, I think we've all got pretty good audio and um, Wi-Fi connections so far, so fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions in here, please drop them in. We'll be answering them throughout. Um, we'll just be waiting for, a, see if a few more people can join. Um, that Possibly that one person who just dropped off there um, to give everyone Excellent. a quick chance. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, do you guys want to quickly start by introducing yourselves? Yep. Hello, my name is Toyin Lakachu. Um, I'm my name's yeah, my name's Toyin Lakachu. I'm I'm from I'm a freelancer, I work as a business development consultant um, on Woods and Up. Um, basically I work within the field of fashion, um, working on export development for fashion, um, business development, um, marketing strategy, um, and pricing strategy with brands. And I've done quite a few events now with Loan Design Club kind of covering a range of business aspects and so forth kind of going forward and I also part-time lecture at Uni University for the Creative Arts Sammy Surrey where I met Fran and um kind of we're now kind of working together on stuff so over to Fran. Yeah yeah very lucky to be working with Toyin so um as Toyin said I'm an educator so I'm a lecturer at UCA within the business school and I mostly cover topics of sustainability and trend um self-confessed uh a fashion futurist and um, I've got a previous experience in visual merchandising, marketing and trend analysis. Great, thank you. Um, just another person joining us now. Apologies if we end up running through the same things a couple of times. I think that's going to happen possibly with um, people joining. Um, no, that's fine. But what we can say is we kind of started decided to start this event a bit earlier because obviously it's Thursday. Um, and, you know, if you are one of those people that likes to go out and see people on the street at eight o'clock and clap for carers, we will make sure that we will finish in time for that to happen. So um, we're very conscious of these things. Yeah, fantastic. I literally, I literally just hang out of my window and just kind of clap <laughs> and say hello to all my neighbours on the street. I might upgrade to pots and pans tonight. I mean, <laughs> I've been gradually like getting more noise going, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Just hang out the window with a karaoke machine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love this idea. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we can probably make a start. Um, so for those who've just joined us, feel free to pop any questions into the chat box. I don't think I actually introduced myself. I'm Amanda. Um, I'm here on behalf of Lone Design Club. So any questions that anyone has, I will be reading them out to Toyin and Fran to answer. So don't be shy. Um, you will Please be heard. Please feel free to throw questions at us as we're kind of kicking off, you know, um, yeah, please do. Great. Well, take it away, guys. Cool. Well, welcome. Thank you very much, guys, for kind of coming and hanging out with us for, for an hour or so to discuss um, creating fashion without creating waste. Um, you know, as I say, me and Fran have kind of been working together in the business school at UCA and have been talking about fashion, sustainability, um, and so forth. And, you know, and it seems to be a, quite a big hot topic. Um, that everybody's kind of talking about sustainability. So, uh, you know, we thought we'd kind of look more in depth around, you know, kind of explore some of the themes around sustainability and actually kind of looking at the wider um, the scope of it and how businesses can, you know, think about um, new approaches um, and, you know, collaboration and so forth. And one of the other things that Mia Fran was talking about the other day was, you know, I don't think we can can ignore the, the current situation in which we're kind of living in at the moment with COVID-19 and coronavirus and how that is also kind of impacting on, on how businesses um, function, 
and how consumers are kind of, you know, how it's changing consumer behavior. So we're gonna kind of try and cover lots of different themes around this, um, but also at the same time, give you some business tips, um, you know, to kind of take away and think within your business. Um, can I just quickly ask, has any, uh, have any of you guys got businesses or brands? Maybe kind of just put a, put a hell yeah up in the air to Amanda, or are you just here because you're not going anywhere? <laughs> So just me, you know, and it's a great way to kind of, you know, um, educate yourself for an evening. Is anybody a business? Is anybody saying? Um, give people some time to, yes, we've got a yes, definitely a startup brand. Great. Yeah. Thank you guys. Great. Great. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of exactly where we were aiming this, weren't we? We were thinking very much along the time, the lines of emerging or or startups okay brilliant okay that's great so you know first of all I think you know let's kick off with you know I think this whole word of sustainability you know brand you know and how people just use this word sustainability and sustainable you know and I think it's, it's maybe we should kind of look at you know um, explore that as a theme and you know how that's defined and you know what's your opinions on that as a word and how we use it and how businesses should kind of think about using that as part of their business approach. Ooh, I mean, that's a good one. I, it's a weird love hate with that word for me, really. Um, it's in my job title. Um, I kind of fell out of love with it a little bit um, a few years ago because it is overused. It is clunky. It's not sexy. And that's really hard in the fashion industry. If you can't get people to engage with, with that word. Um, and for a long time, it had been wrongly used as well. It gets used interchangeably with, with ethics, or it gets used interchangeably with different facets of sustainability, like circular or reuse. Um, but it is a kind of the big overall um, catch-all term, really. Uh, I was just saying to, in our little Instagram live earlier, uh, with Amanda, that sustainability has never meant more because um, there's three prongs to it. There's, there's the planet, there's the people. Um, and it's really interesting that at the moment, especially in the fashion industry, uh, people who maybe have struggled to engage with it from a planetary point of view or from a people point of view, um, are all of a sudden engaging with it from a profit point of view because, you know, you're getting these billion dollar brands um, falling around by our, by our ears at the moment. And the only reason why that's happening, um, you know, three weeks worth of, of not opening their stores and, and they're, they're, they're on the breadline. So that's not sustainable. So um, people always forget about that profit aspect to sustainability and actually making sure that you've got um, responsible success in, in, in what you're doing. So I think that's something that um, probably today more than ever redefines that term for people as well. And everyone remembers that it's not about making something that's, 100% organic, 100%, um, you know, saintly in every way, which is definitely not, you can't actually do that. It's really hard to do that. Um, so don't ever pressure yourself to do that. You kind of need to find your own ethos there. But um, for people making these products and putting effort into them, if they're not turning a profit, if they're not sustaining the, the workforce, then it isn't a sustainable brand, no matter, no matter what pr produce you use or manufacturing methods. So that's where I think... I'm quite interested in that term, in terms of that. Um, and obviously ethics is a completely separate um, discipline to that, linked but separate, for sure, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, when we kind of talk about that, we, mm. you know, talk about sustainability, it's about kind of looking at how, you know, new business approaches to sustainability and redu waste, redu waste reduction, you know. And I think when I was kind of writing the, 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 the brief for this, it was kind of like, you know, um, do we is there any more room for any more brands you mm. know and actually how should we be looking at you know um how we should be looking at fashion and how we take that movement forward um and how we make that much more sustainable and that you know and I think me and family talked about this the other day around you know um people you know you can't it's very difficult at the moment to be able to become a 360 degree kind of circular sustainable brand and, you know, so we need to kind of look at how we can do that in different ways, um, you know, in, in terms of different aspects of our business and how we define sustainability within our business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's the thing. It's the, the, the key thing that you're saying there, Toyin, is about defining yourself. So if you are a small emerging brand, if you are a startup, it's not attempting to be everything to everyone. 
and that's that's really important because um one it's almost impossible to do so but two it's it's about um thinking about what it is that you want to do if you're driving an ethos first business um you know decide whether it's animal cruelty and and non-animal products that you want to focus on decide whether it's um workers rights and fair trade i mean arguably you're going to be trying to do as much of it as possible but um you can't there are some things where you end up with um a choice to be made so if you decide that carbon footprint's really important to you then it's very likely you're going to be trying to make product you know in, in the uk but if at the same time you're saying that you want to support communities of makers artisan communities cultural communities elsewhere then you can't just you know pull that business from from that country you you, you you're better off supporting um uh, those artisans where they are and supporting that community where it is and that sometimes means that you have to choose one of those things you can't do both of them so um and it makes it a lot easier from your marketing and branding perspective as well to have a purpose a, a real sort of sustainable narrative that you can link to yeah and coming back to kind of looking at you know um looking at new business approaches you know we kind of see lots of new business approaches around sustainability that's kind of popping up in terms of you know you kind of see lots of um you know these swap shop kind of places kind of popping up where you can kind of go and trade in your clothes get so much money back and then you can go and shop in their shop and buy that that, that equivalent value of clothing so you know there are new models in terms of how we're looking at sustainability kind of going forward but also there's lots of opportunities that are being created partly by this whole pandemic thing that's going to come on um, but also in waste reduction you know we talk about 360 and you know and trying to trying to round that you know trying to round that square but you know there are so many opportunities in terms of how you know we can create possible systems here in the UK because a lot of the stuff that we do is we're all you know we seem to make stuff and we churn it out and then it ends up in landfield in Indonesia in China and wherever else but actually you know what are we doing as individuals and as businesses to kind of counteract our kind of you know our output that we're putting out there you know and whether or not we can you know at the moment there's not very many companies here in the UK that can you know repurpose or you know repurpose you know old materials at the moment we're kind of going to the, the local recycling tip and putting all our excess clothes that we don't want to wear anymore hopefully hoping they're going to go to a charity shop but actually they end up on you know in Africa and Indonesia and actually they can't be used but what are we doing about how we can kind of use that you know that kind of waste to possibly repurpose or you know create new materials rather than going off and finding you know kind of set up a brand again i'm going to create a brand and creating a whole new system around that brand and creating a whole plethora of, of new materials and so forth to kind of support that brand why not look and see what's already existing and how you can utilize that to help you you know to also to kind of meet your values around sustainability mm -hmm. also to kind of have your part in contribution to reducing carbon emissions and so forth yeah absolutely i think there's a there's an idea that there's definitely room for new ideas and there's room for new businesses but there isn't necessarily um room for for new product we we've, we've got enough so it's it's interesting those new businesses that might tackle that that waste um that we're drowning in our own textiles really aren't we just so as, a, as, a, as a question Ooh. yes yeah. i was just about to say um <laughs> if you guys are happy to take this now i think it's a pretty good question um so on that topic, um, mm. this person here who I don't know their name, but they are, they've said they're interning at Unravelo, um, if I'm saying it correctly, if not, apologies. <laughs> um, they are currently doing research into take back systems. How do you mm -hmm. feel about brands taking back their own clothes to reuse them for new collections? Um, I'm actually, funnily enough, this is also my area of research, so I'm, I'm massively interested in it, so I hope you don't mind I jumped in there. <laughs> um, so for me, I'm quite interested in this uh, reuse approach and thinking about the brands themselves taking ownership of the product completely. So even, you know, at the consumer level, usually from a linear approach, we're talking, you know, as soon as it reaches a customer, um, that's it, the, you know, the brand, that, that's 
but they don't take any more um, responsibility for that product. So I think uh, that's definitely times are changing with things like rental. Um, that's one of the really clear ways where a brand takes control of that product, the entire life journey of that product and has the ability to understand, first of all, how that product was put together, the design of that product, the composition of that product. Um, they're the expert in that product to then be able to take it back and, and you know, disassemble it. Um, so that's a preferred way is that the brand itself that made the product is in control of that. Um, the other take back is um, taking back broadly um, other brands products, pro products that you have no understanding of that composition. Um, we're talking about kind of fiber to fiber recycling there, whether that be mechanically or, or chemically. Um, I think both of those areas have a massive um, opportunity because at the moment they haven't got the finance they haven't got the research and development um, that they need um, to enable smaller businesses to to be able to use it but what I would say for a small business my best tip would be is if you can implement some way of taking control of at least your product then what you'd probably find that you'll end up doing is designing that product to be disassembled you'll feature that within your design process and you'll be wary of things like blended compositions. You'd be wary of um, complicated uh, man, um, construction so that you would make it easier on yourself to, to disassemble that product. So if that is something that, that you're, you're looking into as a small brand, I'd say you'd need um, buy-in from the customer. So there needs to be some um, connection there with why they would bring that product back to you perhaps they don't own it in the first place perhaps you are going for a non-ownership model um, or perhaps you're looking at something that's um, more to do with a scheme where they're incentivizing them to give that product back to you maybe it's more like a leasing thing like mud jeans do a bit like that but um, I definitely think it's something to, to um, uh, persevere with and and as a brand capture that product yeah, I think that is a really big area at the moment that yeah. a lot of brands are exploring. And then, you know, over that last year, I've worked with, with a couple of small startup, you know, um, you know, brands, both in jewellery and accessories. And both one, you know, in terms of the jewellery side, there's a lot of kind of recycled gold um, as, a, as, as a concept. Um, so, you know, trading, you know, kind of rummaging through, you know, your old jewellery collection and finding all those scraps of, you know, that, that one earring that you've kind of got left in gold and then being able to trace it in, get a, get a weight for it, you know, and then being able to kind of take the value of that gold and put it towards another product within yeah. that brand's collection. Um, but I think that is a really good, you know, one, it kind of helps to kind of show your, demonstrate your brand value and what you, you your, um, your values and your ethos and how you, you're planning to contribute to the sustainability movement, you know, so you're kind of appealing to customers. But also, um, if you're kind of taking a take back model where you kind of create it into a model where it's kind of like, well, you know, if you want to bring your bag back, we'll give you a discount on any new products, so to speak, then it also creates customer loyalty, mm. you know, um, and you'll you're always have an ongoing customer kind of coming to you in that kind of respect. I think a lot of brands are looking at ways of how they kind of can exploit and possibly seize that opportunity, but, you know, also kind of, be given back to the environment in some kind of way or, or, or so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully that answered that that query there. Um yeah, I think that was that was good. Yeah. Cool. So kind of coming back to you know waste reduction and you know and looking at you looking at brands and how you kind of work and stuff like that, you know, some of the things you can kind of think about in terms of some other business tips is you know when we think about if you're looking to start up a brand, you know, um you know, um, you know, in terms of sustainability, I think the, the, the name of the game is compromise. You know, um, we can't kind of, I think we're, in, we're kind of coming into a world now where we can't have what we want. You know, COVID's kind of made it like, you know, you go to Tesco's and you can't buy your usually pasta anymore because it's all out of stock. So you've got, got, got to buy penne pasta instead. So I think, we're, I think when it comes to fashion, the same same kind of rules apply as you know things like climate change start to impact and become a bigger noise within mm. the world you know we have to kind of think consciously how we kind of create products and so thinking about the style and the design and as, as Fran was kind of saying about the composition to the material but also kind of looking to explore what's already out there 
you know there are so many factories and fashion houses and fashion brands that are just stocked up on unused materials that are just hoarded up where they've you know they've gone to China or wherever and gobbled up lots of material and you know I think we've had we've heard in in recent times about the the the, the negative stories about some of the you know the high-end luxury brands basically burning off you know products that they don't want to sell or burning off materials because they don't want anybody else having it you know that aside there's lots of factories out there that have huge amounts of stock and if you're willing to compromise and make those compromises then why don't you go and approach those factories or approach those brands and say hey you know i'm making a collection can i purchase you know your your stock from you and there's lots of new companies that are popping up in the area who are buying up excess materials so rather than kind of going off and making your own materials, also it's, it's much more much more viable for you in terms of reducing your waste reduction. You know, if you kind of think about how much material you need to produce, you know, get produced to be able to produce, I don't know, one dress, you know, to produce, produce that particular dress or that particular pair of jeans or pair, pair, pair of trousers, you know, you could possibly kind of manage how much material you had if you were to were able to kind of use unwanted you know, um, dead stock material, so to speak. Yeah, I think um, dead stock is definitely something that's quite interesting because I'm quite, I'm so kind of more on the side of post-consumer, but pre-consumer waste, there's a, exactly like you say, there's warehouses of inventory to be used. And you see people like Reformation, their entire business model is based on, on, on pre-consumer waste inventory and end of role. So I think, um, you know, and, and actually that that's such a huge part of their aesthetic as well. What they've done is they've embraced that. They've embraced that ditzy print that they, they go out and, and buy um, stock for. Um, and, and it's, you know, we see a Reformation dress and they've got such a distinct design and they always use very similar kind of um, bohemia style fabrics that they, they've embraced that. They've, they've been able to carve out a space um, visually for themselves by doing that as designers. And so, you know, don't see, yes, there might be, um, you know, you might see it as some, some way as not being traditional in the sense that it has been since the nineties in terms of being able to get what you want. Uh, but actually in true design style, if you can work with what's there, that's actually where, you know, um, most design, best design comes from is, is, is that kind of, um, that kind of mother of necessity is the mother of, uh, in innovation, isn't it? So, uh, I think that could be something that you take on if you are a small designer. Uh, set yourself these challenges, and I think that's may maybe where some of the most exciting brands are going to come from. Definitely. And so, kind of moving on, you know, um, come, coming back to COVID again, you know, sustainability and where the trend is going, you mm -hmm. know, and the impact on the whole situation around COVID, and you know, how we kind of going to move forward once we come out of lockdown, and, and what that means for yeah. business. Yeah, so um, I suppose from that point of view, there's there's a lot of unknowns. So we've got um, the consumer uh, is our biggest unknown probably at the moment. We have no idea whether people are thirsty for for, for the shopping. We don't know whether they're going to go out and revenge buy. We were talking about coffee earlier, but we've, we've definitely seen Hermes revenge buying um you know, this is a new store opening in China and they, you know, millions being, being made and sort of millions, but, um, but you can see that people's reaction there is that they, their consumption habits have maybe gone more so at least if they've not found this quiet moment of Zen, which, which some of the fashion futurists and myself included were, were hoping for. So the consumer is a massive um, unknown at the moment and but there are some really interesting things that we have seen. And we, me and Toyin were talking about this the other day about UK manufacturing and, and the possibilities that have suddenly emerged there, that um, there is a, a UK manufacturing force and, and they, yeah, they've been kind of long silent, really. We haven't heard so much about them until all of a sudden we need scrubs and masks and, and, and they're really coming out of the woodwork and, and showing off their flexibility and showing off their ability to um you know bend and fold to, to what's required so i think that's something that hopefully maintains and and also encourages the skills 
these skills gaps be filled up as well. I'm hoping people taking, you know, trialing sewing, maybe even just at home or, or just out of necessity to repair things at this moment, um, might realize that that's something they're enjoying. They might find that. So even from a personal level, there could be some really good opportunities there as well. Um, mm. But we do have a skills gap um, broadly. So if we, if we just took that one thing, UK manufacturing, we definitely at the moment do not have the workforce we need to sustain that um, long term or, or more, probably more to grow it really. Um, so that's probably the bit that I'm interested in as an educator thinking about how education perhaps needs to shift um, to be able to fill, fill that void and you know you go to these great um, factories small small factories in the UK and a lot of the workforce is you know slightly older maybe 50s or above and we don't have that many young pattern cutters and we don't have that many young machinists or sample makers and I think that's something that again will hopefully be a really good opportunity within education even from a, a point of view of that of apprenticeships and things yeah and I think as well what's happened you know in the light of what's happened with the, the COVID is you know the possibility of fast tracking the sustainability movement um you know mm -hmm. I think you know, I think a lot of businesses have been thinking about sustainability. We were talking about it. You know, people, you know, brands have been playing with it and using it as part of their brand values. You know, you see a lot of the fast fashion brands kind of talking about it and bringing out, you know, eco kind of eco like um, collections and so forth. But you know, there there is a lot of but a lot of brands are kind of working towards you know trying to be net zero carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. You know, three three sixty recyclable goods by 2025 but I think in light of what's happening I think you know possibly that's kind of fast tracked forward and I think you know I hope and you know we're not going to go back to this mass consumerism that we've had forever and we've had time we've had downtime for like the last four weeks you know it's going to be seven weeks by the time we come out of this mm. but we've kind of gone all this time hopefully in some in some capacity not having to kind of buy clothes or buy things and i think and we've kind of used our time in different ways rather than spending our time buying lots of stuff to kind of keep us occupied and so forth and i think hopefully maybe what will happen is there'll be a shift in consumer behavior and we'll be a bit and can be a bit more conscious about what we're buying and you know why we're buying it you know we've kind of managed to go if you're not buying online, <laughs> manage to go like three, four weeks without buying any new clothes. So do I really need any more clothes? So maybe there might be a, a movement there. But yeah, coming back to the point on, you know, what Fran was kind of saying about the manufacturing movement, you know, it's very interesting to see and it's great to see that, um, you know, it's fired up that whole industry here in the UK. And I think, you know, working with a lot of small startup brands there has been quite a lot of resistance in some cases um, with UK manufacturers wanting to engage with smaller brands if they don't hit certain quantity levels or if they don't have certain kinds of styles and I think you know with COVID kind of happening we've kind of seen you know factories that have been making I don't know Mary Katransu dresses and you know all these other big designer brand dresses to now making scrubs you know literally overnight and I think they've kind of realised that, you know, they need to kind of keep that going. You know, they, they need work, so to speak. So, you know, the fact that they've been able to change their business model and their, you know, the types of products they, that they create, hopefully that's going to open up more opportunities for smaller brands to be able to kind of push forward, you know. But also with that, you know, um, hopefully we can then kind of grow our homegrown kind of circular economy here in the UK in terms of you know from design to production to repurposing to bring it back into the system but also for smaller and startup brands it kind of creates an opportunity for you to be able to it's easier for you to manage rather than going to places like China and going overseas you know um, and help and so therefore being able to kind of streamline your your supply chains much easier and I think you know in the light of COVID that has really kind of exposed what's happening, you know, how we've just become so dependent on having such an interconnected global world in how we kind of manufacture and how we source our products, you know, and when the whole world is shut down, 
how the impact that has on business. You know, I know someone who, you know, some, I know someone very close to me who works in the fashion industry for a fast fashion label and all their, their product is manufactured in China. Um, and at the moment, potentially they might not have an autumn winter collection to put into store this year because of the whole way in which the, the manufacturing design process happens within these industries. So I think we need to really think and re reevaluate how we kind of, you know, move forward with fashion. You know, and hopefully if you're kind of bringing it back home, then hopefully you should be able to make smaller quantities of clothing. So kind of fitting back in with the movement, you know, um, rather than having to have 250 dresses in one style and it's kind of like I'm a small brand, how am I supposed to sell 250 dresses when I don't have a huge number of stockings for it? So, you know, and again with traceability, but also the other word, Brexit, you know, <laughs> first time saying said Bring that. Brexit. <laughs> Brexit, what's that? What's that? It seems like such a lifetime. Life Sad news. Sadly, it's still there. <laughs> but, you know, again, if we can kind of revive and kind of foster this whole, you know, manufacturing sector here in the UK, then it counteracts a whole load of stuff around globalisation and Brexit kind of going forward. Someone's got a question or yeah. someone says, hello, I am yeah. Sol. I will read it out for you. Um, I just wanted to start with a simple question. Um, what do you think about the future of the leather industry? Is it coming to an end with ve and will vegan leather take its place? Ooh, vegan leather. Good one. Well, I mean, <laughs> this is exactly what we were talking about before, this whole kind of sustainability and ethics going head to head. Um, there is far too many uh, vegan products on the market that are um, not helping the situation. Uh, being polymer based, being plastics based, um, that is, is obviously where maybe somebody's ethics is bigger than somebody's sustainability and that, that's that where that comes in. Um, veganism is massively on the up. Um, in terms of sort of trend analysis, uh, it's probably one of the biggest stories that we have from a consumer behaviours point of view. But what's interesting about it is when it comes to leather goods, uh, you've got this other overwhelming story, which is luxury. And currently, um, the luxury goods market, especially the small luxury goods market, bags and purses, um, is maintaining that that level of, of success by by being quite traditional in their processes. And I think people in, in some mindsets still do value um, leather from that perspective. Now, what I think is the happy medium in between that are good leather alternatives that are not adding to the plastics issue. So those are the ones I think have the power and, and people like Stella McCartney have, 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 have been really looking into this and have got some great products on the market. Um, that's where I think maybe the little uh, golden nugget is, is, is thinking about vegan products that um, are not adding to the issue um, that, you know, maybe luxury brands are championing as well and that will still provide that, um, that sense of uh, tradition that those, those people buy those products for and, and why they invest in those particular high branded luxury um, products as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know what you think about it, Toyin. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, the whole kind of vegan versus leather debate. Um, I think it's an education thing around that. Um, mm. and, you know, um, obviously with vegan leather, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's great, but it does have its pitfalls in terms of, you know, it's non it, you can't recycle it still. So we're still kind of falling into that whole trap of, you know, trying to be sustainable, trying to be eco-friendly, but, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's, it's very difficult to recycle vegan leather. Um, but also on the other hand, we have this whole, you know, depending on where in the world you're looking to sell, you have this whole education and changing of people's mindsets around leather. Um, and, you know, and again, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's about kind of trying to, trying to change people's mindsets around leather and, you know, the whole ethics versus sustainability, but also the fact that leather can be seen as a byproduct, you know, so to speak, in certain certain scenarios, so it's quite a difficult one to kind of. It's yeah. so intertwined with the food industry, isn't it? Because yeah. um, obviously, veganism is is cross industry. So um, 
if we need less cattle because beef becomes less um, popular and by default that means that we obviously have less hides then that will be a natural decline and I think that's very interesting and I think that's something that most people would get on board with is a natural decline of, of cattle um, farming everywhere I mean in the US they grow alfalfa in the desert to feed cattle it's bonkers I mean the, the water used to, to grow alfalfa in the desert isn't is a whole other story but um, so I'm, I'm totally on board with the need to reduce um, beef primarily which will in turn reduce hides which will in turn reduce virgin leather for for products um but there's still again that issue of there's a lot of leather out there so um that that's still an opportunity for um business and then you've obviously got these really great innovations things like um leaf leather uh, which i'm just fascinated by and those things are biodegradable and, and i think that that research and development into those materials is is the most acceptable um, niche here I think yeah we need more development mm. and alternatives other than leather um, for people to kind of then move away from it same as that what's happened with you know vegetarian vegetarianism and veganism you know I don't know five years ago you know to be fair I, I went to university most probably 20 years ago and I, I did actually live with a vegan and it, at the time it was a very very rare thing but you know now it's kind of like you know in like the last five years or so it's become such a big thing so mm -hmm. you know give it some give it some more time and i think we will evolve and we will find much more suitable alternatives to, to leather and you know potentially that will become a byproduct um you know so to speak but it's about it's about consumer behavior um you know and whilst that demand is there it's a very difficult one to balance yeah absolutely yeah um, hopefully well, that. So, kind of going on to the next point, um, why is it so important for fashion to become much more collaborative in this kind of environment? Uh, well, it was interesting because what we sort of last touched on was that kind of the death of globalization as such. Um, but what I find really fascinating about, um, you know, the, the, the pure distress. That, that Brexit caused with this death of globalization is that um, from my perspective, um, especially from within the fashion industry, we might be global, but we're definitely not collaborative. We're definitely not a community. And currently the way things are um, being exposed in terms of you know uh, buyers not paying up for orders already made, already placed, um, is that we, don't treat the rest of the globe how we'd expect to be treated. So our, our global community is not quite as such what we possibly thought with tears rolling down our face in 2015. Um, and I think that's something that we've just got to face up to. Um, but from the point of view of collaboration, um, thinking about um, what fashion is now. So where we're at now is that it's super competitive. Um, you know, people basically compete on the points of secrecy and the points of irresponsibility. Um, the, the people at the top are the people that are um, making them the most amount of money, the most amount of margin, the most amount of profit. So um, for them, you know, even just the, the process of comp shopping is so important to them as brands because being competitive is, is everything. And, and so that's what's allowed them to do this kind of race to the bottom where we're at at the moment, which, you know, brands competing on 50p within the pound on, on exactly the same dress by the looks of it. Um, because the customer's in control, the customer is able to price check between these brands, there's very low customer loyalty. So there's a huge um, disparity between where the fashion system is currently at. And actually, as soon as you change around your business model and you decide to be ethos first and profit first, all of a sudden you need other people. All of a sudden, as soon as we start talking about leaf leather, we need scientists, we need engineers, we need um, people that are interested in taking on a, you know, a whole new kind of textiles environment. So um, all of a sudden, not, you know, there's, there's cross-industry collaboration there, thinking about people like um, Parley for the Oceans, who have worked with people like Adidas and O'Neill and G-Star, um, thinking about waste um, plastic in the oceans and, and collecting that up and, and working with those brands to create product. Um, that's all of a sudden what you need as soon as you change your ethos, as soon as you, you turn your head um, away from profit. Um, but that goes for smaller brands too as well. I mean, when you're small, you need um, like-minded people more than ever. You need 
um, strong relationships with your manufacturers, you need strong relationships with your marketers and PR. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose more than anyone, Toyin knows this working with smaller brands is um, powwowing with, with consultants and, and having that um, someone maybe who's maybe five months ahead of you in this in this game is is everything um even better still someone that's a year ahead or 10 years ahead and and it's not about you know this kind of like mine thing that we've always been doing in the fashion industry anymore and, and that's not really gonna you know cut the mustard um but yeah i suppose that's something that you deal with quite quite often toyin yeah but also kind of looking at yeah looking at kind of collaboration it's kind of as you say kind of coming together and working together you know, and maybe, you know, as well as, you know, the different great ideas you talk, talked about there, but also kind of like brands coming together, you know, mm. and looking to find like-minded brands in your sector, in your in your industry, or with the same values as you, and, you know, and kind of come back to the whole thing of, you know, creating fashion without creating waste, you know, get to come together, create a collection mm. for a season, reduce the amount of, you know, of items and products you're making but like merge together and create one collection cohesive collection together that will also help to leverage your brand status you know and kind of send out a message around sustainability but also kind of you know attract a new a new potential audience you know people like nike who's a, you know i think we we'll spoke back the other day about like you know nike being really good and being very open in terms of you know how it collaborates with smaller brands in lots of different innovative kind of ways you know i'm not necessarily saying to you go and find nike and do collaboration with them but you know using you know thinking about you know rather than creating a 15 piece collection it's kind of going well let's create a seven piece collection but let's do a collaboration with another brand and make a collection that you know that complements us both and we can we can kind of launch that as a one season you know one of collection so to speak so there's lots of things you can kind of do around that you know which as a small brand is a great way to kind of raise your your brand profile and attract new customers to you we see questions coming in oh yeah <laughs> um, so we've got two questions um both from chris thank you for sending those in um he says slightly off tangent but is there a learning curve that fashion boutiques slash independent retailers need to go through before more sustainably produced and or digital printed clothing that's actually attractive will be something that they're interested in regularly stocking is this talking about the reason maybe i'll just have to click on it just to double check if it's talking about retailers or yeah I don't know. Okay, fashion boutiques and independent retailers. Mm, okay. That's attractive. <laughs> I love that point. Um, yeah, well, I suppose actually that's something that at the moment this, the the fashion boutiques, independent retailers, um, they are. I mean, everybody's customer led. Like I said, the customer's in control. Um, what the customer wants, the um, retailers tend to follow up with, um, with sort of search bar um, regulation and, and all of the things that they do as retailers. We take the bigger ones like ASOS and Amazon. Um, so they are moving on it, but I don't think they necessarily understand it. Um, there's a big education problem within the retailers as well. If you think about I, I talk to my students often about this this curve they're going to come up against because I'm educating them about sustainable buying or sustainable management or sustainable marketing. Um, but I'm also telling them how it is now because it's so important if they're going into the industry now that they understand that their bosses and their bosses' bosses are part of the industry of, of the now, of the 90s, and they don't quite see it the way that maybe a small part of the a growing part of, of, of customers are seeing it and, and wanting it to change so I think that is going to be something that's not automatic that is something that is gradual um, and at the moment we will see it as optional it will be like um, you know I know that ASOS have a, a conscious tick box a responsible kind of tick box so if you want to see products like that um, you can tick on it. Um, but rightly, as you say, Chris, there is an image issue. Uh, there is far too much um, Jersey-based... Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Far too much Jersey-based organic cotton. Um, the word vegan thrown in at any random moment. 
and uh, recycled polyester galore, which, you know, it's great, but actually um, when you look into that, there's, you know, there's not um, nearby recycled polyester plants and it's not coming from used clothing, it's coming from mattresses and, and random things like that because we haven't got the, the infrastructure in place, but um, it is gradual and we will be getting there. Um, so I don't know what you think about that, Toyin. Yeah, I think, you know, coming back to what um, Fran said earlier at the beginning, until businesses kind of start thinking about customers um, and what customers want versus profit, you know, that's ultimately what's driving everything at the moment. And I think in the light of the retail sector, and again, with COVID and Brexit, you know, they're all just playing it really safe in terms of what they buy, you know, what they know their customers like. They don't want to take risks. And ultimately, that's what's kind of possibly hindering, in some respects, some of the movement in terms of, you know, wanting to buy, you know, sustainable, sustainable products and so forth. And also the price, you know, around sustainable products. You know, a lot of sustainable products are very, you know, the price on them at the moment you know, and that's obviously, you know, part of the whole kind of, you know, process of becoming a startup brand and economies of scale and getting your pricing strategy right and so forth. But ultimately, retailers are led by price and what they think is going to sell. Um, and, you know, when you're, you're a retail buyer, you're only as good as your last season sale. And if you've not sold enough, then, you know, the likelihood is you're not going to be there next season. You know, yeah. and I think that's that's one of the biggest issues that re retail has, you know, and I think it's with everything, you know, unless you put it in front of the customers and show them the new stuff, then how can you educate your customers in wanting to buy that? Yeah, and and there is, I mean, the, the, the consumer's no angel as well. So when we're talking about the fact that, yeah, it does basically boil down consumer demand, while you can still sell eight pound pair of jeans legally, the customers will probably still buy them. Um, so there is a customer desire for cheap, fast clothing. Um, we have a value action gap there. there we, we know that you ask a customer questionnaire, should everyone be paid fairly? Will you pay more for their clothes? They will always say yes. Um, it doesn't necessarily translate into their sales power. Yeah. We've got another one. I see lots of questions coming in. A good one. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, a question in regards to the ethics and sustainability of fashion shows. With so many seasons every year, luxury has almost adapted a fast fashion model of its own. Fashion shows have become more and more extravagant, thus more and more wasteful with their props and decor, their greenwashing, etc. As consumers, we have expressed a lot of negativity around this waste and have been slowly moving towards more mindful spending, how do you think fashion shows will evolve? I know Fran has written a piece on the matter, but I was wondering whether rather than disappearing, the brands will appeal to the customers by doing their shows, for example, online only, or perhaps adapt to the beauty model of no seasons, but hyped releases. Yeah, I think, I think trade shows and fashion shows, I think, I think, yeah, I think there's going to be a shift in terms of how they go going forward. And, and again, kind of not to keep going on about it, the pandemic and everything, I think that is really going to change how business is, is done. And it'll be interesting to see what happens next season, you know, next, next season round of Paris, New York, um, Milan Fashion Weeks, you know, before, just before, well, just as we the, the COVID-19 started, you know, Amani kind of put their, still run their fashion show, but they did it behind closed doors and just basically, you know, um, did it as a video for people to be able to kind of film it so people could watch it online and stream it and so forth. But I think there will be a shift in terms of how that's done. And also technology is taken over massively in terms of how, how fashion is designed and how we kind of engage with those types of, you know, types of scenarios kind of going forward. And I think London College Fashion and Matthew Drinkwater has worked a lot around, you know, creating these kind of 3D kind of concept, um, you know, 3D kind of visual um, kind of catwalk and runway shows, so to speak, kind of going forward. So I think there's a, a big evolution coming in, in the next, you know, couple of years around fashion shows and also fashion just generally um, and how you kind of, you know, buy and sell it. Yeah. 
I mean, there's there's, there's two um, systems at play there. You've got the the system of the product um, and this kind of endless seasons within seasons within seasons, which just mean nothing anymore. There's just so many of them. I mean, who needs crews? Um, but by the same note, we've also got the the actual event side of it, which is is wasteful in itself. So two of those things are are connected for sure. And and exactly like Toyin saying is from the event side of things, there's so many fantastic opportunities out there with holographic shows or really exciting um, uplifts from the kind of periscope model that Burberry uh, trialed first of all. Um, what we know now is that the shows aren't about the buyers. The shows are about consumer, direct to consumer now. Um, the fact that London Fashion Week is, um, well, was, was supposed to be open to, you know, mainly consumers and it was a ticket buying um, event um, shows that it's not the selection event that it used to be. It's not, it doesn't have the same purpose. So as soon as you take that into account and you realize that, okay, hold on a minute here, this is just a, a, a direct to consumer connection point for the brand, then it makes sense to, to lift that off of, you know, five direct locations across the globe, which are now definitely, um, you know, not on the money when you think about things like Seoul, Copenhagen, Berlin being so much more exciting in terms of, of those um, sort of what would be called the kind of sideshows, but they're, they're more in interesting than the main ones now. Um, so from the event point of view, I think absolutely. And also from the product point of view, um, I mean, the designers themselves are crying out for it. They're, they're tired. They can't keep up with this constant schedule. Um, and, you know, the Demna Vasala piece in 2016 um, was absolutely opting for what you say, the, the hype drop model release. Um, but I think that's, that's charged by a trend in itself. That's charged by this hype branding um, uh, sort of logomania luxury that we're in at the moment. Um, if we look a bit further into the distance when that bubbles away and um, we're not looking for kind of limited edition or short sharp drops um, it's likely we're going to have the space and peace of mind for designers to design slow um, you know really curate a collection and just be far more artist and commercial um, than they ever have been before and I'm really excited for I was talking about this with Toyin the other day I'm really excited to be able to watch shows and tell the difference between designers just based on aesthetic because they've had the chance to craft an identity again and they're not chasing the money and they're not chasing um, this logo mania aesthetic which you know links in with this hyped releases. Um, so I think hype releases will be a good segue but I don't think it's the end goal. I think the end goal is um, quality product with a very unique aesthetic um, when you think of people like Chilean, um, they they very much work to their own aesthetic and they they haven't signed up to this logo mania that we're in at the moment. Yeah. I think what we've learned from this whole situation is you don't need to be in a room to get anything done anymore. You, or you don't all need to be in the same room to get anything done anymore. <laughs> you know, so this whole kind of thing of everybody needs to get on a plane and go to New York to go and watch a runway show. You know, I think we've kind of, I think, that kind of thing is kind of done now. We can all sit in our own houses and watch and runway shows, but it also kind of opens up opportunities for smaller brands to kind of create, you know, create content and create, you know, you know, kind of create content and new ways of kind of pushing out their collections without maybe doing a trade show or, you know, maybe kind of doing, you know, doing a, their own kind of catwalk, catwalk show or some kind of visual, you know, um, visual kind of, you know, artistry. Um, in, in showing their collections without having to spend lots of money kind of touring it around the world because as we can all see we're all sitting here you know in our houses and flats and just kind of talking online and watching things online so you know I think I think there is I think things are going to change um, in the coming years you know and, and also you know from what happened in the last session of Paris that, you know or the last session of the, the trade shows there was a significant drop off because people weren't traveling. So if people are not traveling to trade shows, then, you know, I'm not too sure, you know, how we kind of counteract that. So I think there will be a shift, potentially a shift around how, you know, buyers buy and how, um, how consumers kind of continue to consume stuff, definitely. 
Yeah. Have you answered that, Alex? Answer it. <laughs> Can we answer it? <laughs> I, I should say so. <laughs> Oh, we've got another question coming in. Do you want to answer it now? Or? Yeah, go on in. We're on a roll. We're on a roll. Yeah, um, like a discussion. Again, <laughs> again from Chris. Um, what do you think is the role of influencers in promoting sustainable fashion, especially post COVID 19? Ooh. Well, <laughs> did, Joy, did you want to go? Or? You can go, Frank. Right. No, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, uh, influencer marketing. Um, I mean, the, the, the basic point of influencer marketing is, is like-mindedness. Uh, I recently spoke to a sustainable, or ethical, I should say, ethical PR um, company, which I think is an, an interesting concept in itself, that that seems to be separate from, from main play PR, which is mad because everything to do with PR is to do with, with connection. Um, so um, influencers... They've, they're definitely, I think, waning in terms of their importance to fashion. And I think they'll probably, um, you know, their decline is going to pretty much correlate with that of, of, of mass market um, as well. So they're, they're great at marketing from a surface level and, and from, you know, from the point of view of uh, product visually and and we know that because things like millennial pink wasn't actually a product trend. It was a, it was an Instagram trend. Pink was everywhere in 2015. Um, but people weren't actually buying it. It was just something that people liked on, on Instagram. So people are leaving, like leading these double lives. And so brands are starting to not invest so much in this form of marketing because it doesn't necessarily translate to sales. On the other hand of it though, if you can take it, just a bit deeper than visual and you can actually get people to align themselves with someone as a human being and their values then that could almost be the resurgence of influencer marketing um if you can get somebody to say this is what i believe these are my ethics and and this is how i live my life and buy products to go along with that i think that is much stronger in terms of influencer marketing um, and there is almost a possibility of resurgence and you know instead of tracking the the route down alongside mass market it could definitely come back up again um, if people use it wisely from that point of view um, but that means vetting people um, and i think that's probably where that um, ethical pr company come in is that they they become an expert in in matching people up and i think it'd almost be like a matchmaking service i suppose yeah I think I think influencers are going to be, are not going anywhere for a start, um, and um, you know I think we had we had Navazin, didn't we? Um, who roller, 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 is it roller disco girl? Yeah, roller um, disco girl. Yeah, yeah, roller disco girl, and she kind of gave some really interesting stats on the size of the influencer, the growth of the influencer market. You know, in twenty twenty one, it's just going to be worth a stupid amount of money. Mm. Um, but I think the, the, the key thing about whether or not they are a sustainable, whether it's sustainable fashion or whether it's just general fashion or any kind of product, you have to, you know, I think it's important to kind of build a strategy with that influencer. Mm. You know, I think we are done with, you know, having an influencer pop up on our screen looking very beautiful and stunning and like draped in some kind of clothing. I think it's really important for, if you are going to work with influencers, to create a strategy, to create a story that fits in with their life, that they use your products as an everyday product, not just, oh, I need to put this dress in today and take a picture of myself um, and, you know, and kind of promote this brand. It just has to be part of them. And I think that's, you know, because we are seeing through when we're, you know, consumers are seeing through and can see when they're being sold to um, versus when they just see something that they like, like and kind of say, I love the dress, where did you get it from? But also, you know, influencer marketing, I think we need to kind of look in terms of how we use influencer marketing and the shift in terms of where social media is going, you know, and the evolution of new social media platforms, you know, TikTok. I'm too old for TikTok, but I have been looking at TikTok recently because I've, <laughs> I've just written a blog about trends for 2020. Spent five hours on it the other day, really bad. <laughs> because you do, you do just get sucked into it. But, you know, 
you've got these new platforms that are evolving, you know, and there's lots of stuff that's going on on Instagram, which people complain about, you know, the fact that their, their posts are not being seen, not getting that level mm. of engagement, you know, there's lots of, lots of people talking about the aesthetics of some of the influencers, you know, feeds, they're not kind of looking real, they're not kind of, you know, people can't relate to them, they want to see, you know, a bit more kind of unclean, sanitized feeds and so forth kind of going forward and I think you know you need to kind of think about where your audience is and how you engage with them whether that's TikTok whether that's Facebook you know whether that's Twitter whether that's um whether that's you know um Instagram but also you know another thing to kind of think about is things like blogs and working with influencers that have really good blogs you know um because actually a blog will a blog post is worth so much more in, in some respect than a, an image on Instagram, you know, um, because once, you know, once the image has kind of gone up, you know, five or six posts later, you're, you know, within their feed, you've disappeared. Whereas if someone kind of goes on to an influencer or a blogger's website, they can find that blog and they can find the links to go to your website and they can still continue to purchase. You know, I see, I work with lots of brands that have lots of links with blog, bloggers and so forth and like five or six years on they're still getting that level of traffic coming through to their website from those blog posts that where they've written about their products and their brands and so forth so you know you need to kind of think about your wider strategy in terms of who you use and how you use them um, and what you know and what kind of message you want them to put out mm, 100% and I like that the message and the longevity key. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, not got that much time left, but um, but I thought let's talk about because um, we we'll talk about some stuff. So you know, creating sustainable communities was something that we were really interested in, kind of exploring with these guys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I know we we'll talked about collaboration, but also kind of thinking about creating sustainable communities, and it kind of comes back to that question again of you know, um, do we need more fashion brands? Sorry, you know, um, not here to hurt or offend anybody, but but should we be looking at you know what other opportunities there are for businesses to be created to, to support fashion brands and to create a sustainable environment for fashion, to, you know, to, for sustainable fashion to kind of grow as you know as a theme and as something that you know as something that's a, a lifestyle for us, so to speak. And kind of going forward yeah um yeah and exactly what we, we were speaking about the other day is that um i mean there's two there's two communities at play here we've got global we've got local um and we've gone a little bit about sort of the global community and and maybe the challenges that we're at at the moment as well with that and and hopefully where we'll end up with um supply chains where everybody is as important as the next person um but there's, there's also really interesting elements within local as well that I think, I, you know, um, from the point of view of being a smaller business, the people that are on, on this call, um, it seems to me that that's, that's quite a focus for people, is thinking about um, who's around them in terms of their community. Uh, one of the biggest issues I have with, I mean, the area that I love, the area I work in is responsible fashion, is that it's massively elitist. Yeah um it, it's it's so hipster you know we were talking about you know if i want to go and refill my cereal um mason jar i need to rock up to somewhere in shoreditch to be able to do that i can't just do that in my local town because it's it's not something that exists there um and we're always talking about premium brands um you know and as much as i totally am behind that idea of high quality, spending more, making it last. Um, that's not a narrative that necessarily translates over to everybody. Um, you know, and there's somewhere in between that and, you know, the budget retailers um, of this world that are selling jeans for eight pound, um, because that's absolutely not democratic. The point of that is for someone to fill 100 bags, not one bag. People aren't going into those shops and buying one thing. So there's a beautiful space somewhere in between premium and ridiculously cheap where um, there's not a lot of people acting at the moment. Um, and that's probably because not many people are thinking about 
um, creating brands which are using things that already exist, um, you know, and thinking about complex supply chains, thinking about, you know, shipping things in, buying things in really, really high units. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, that's, that's a huge amount of money. So from a community point of view, if you can think about um, who your community actually is and stop trying to um, necessarily sell to this one sort of middle class consumer that, you know, it seems that the whole ethical and sustainable market is, is, is trying to tap into. And um, that's really the only way that genuinely this agenda moves forward if everybody's involved. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, kind of thinking about sustainability, you know, as an everyday, everyday, everyday staple item that, you know, everybody from the working class mm. through to, you know, the mega rich people can kind of have, you know, kind of going forward. Um, and, you know, and with that, you know, with that, you then bring everybody on board, you know, um, because at the moment it is, as, as Fran says, it is just for the rich, the cool and the hipster people. <laughs> you know of, of the world and actually you know if you want to kind of create a sustainable community then you need to create one that's for everybody and, and everybody can contribute in some kind of way but um but also kind of thinking about you know creating you know coming back to kind of creating community and um, sustainable communities you know i'm kind of working with year three and, and year one um university students at the moment and actually they're kind of thinking about you know coming back to looking at looking at the fashion sector and, or looking at their sex and kind of going well we want to do something sustainable but what can we do but they're all kind of come up with very interesting business models and new business enterprises which can you know provide services to to the sector rather than kind of create a brand they're kind of creating a new service that can support the sector whether that's repurposing clothes whether that's customization um whether that's kind of you know creating cleaning services with sustainable, you know, cleaning products or eco-friendly cleaning products. But there's, you know, I think, you know, fashion, we, we tend to be a little bit disjointed, you know, we all kind of work, sometimes work in silos. And I think there's so much kind of going on around us. And it's really important to kind of think about, well, you know, this is my skill, this is what I can bring to the table. But, you know, maybe I could source, you know, some repurposed products from you or, you know, if you've got excess stock, let me take it and I can make it into new, new, a new collection for myself. You know, I think there's ways in which we can work together without it being competitive, you know, because I think, you know, there is this fear of, oh, they're going to steal my customers and stuff like that. And I think we just need to be a bit more open-minded. If the industry is going to move forward and businesses are going to survive, there has to be an element of collaboration and, you know, building a, a strong community foundations around us. So to keep kind of going forward you know but yeah. also within that community upskilling people so as, as frank kind of said at the beginning we was talking about the fact that you know there's been this undervaluing and underappreciation for lots of different skills within manufacturing but if we can kind of you know pattern cutters pattern cutters get paid a lot of money if you're a pattern cutter that that is that is one of the the, the biggest biggest struggles that a lot of brands have is trying to find a really good pattern cutter. But if we can upskill and encourage people to take on apprenticeships and learn these types of skills, it, it, we all benefit and we all value from that. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, you talk to pattern cutters, people that this is their bread and butter and they've been doing it for maybe 40, 50 years. They're absolutely, they're laughing, thinking that people have got now trying to get degrees to be a pattern cutter. And that is a massive system problem within the fashion industry is that um, we've managed to end up where you need a degree to be a pattern cutter. And, and these pattern cutters that are, you know, nearing retirement now, that's not how they worked. They were, they were apprentices first. They, they did, you know, a H&G or, or something that was really vocational. Um, so really, from an education point of view, we've wrapped ourselves up in knots, making everything so academic for the sake of academic. Um, you know, and we don't value it even from the point of view of primary school or secondary school. Um, secondary school league tables are obsessed with how many people they turn over into universities yeah. um, and universities like like the one we work at you know um, originally was an art school originally offered vocational courses and and sometimes I look through the windows of the, the fashion department and I think 
yes, some of these people might end up being designers and, and obviously doing a fashion design course, they hope so, but actually what's wrong with, if, with the majority of these people ending up as machinists if, if they're getting paid a fair wage and they're, um, you know, have job satisfaction. So from upskilling point of view, I think that's also where there could be some really great opportunities with small brands is thinking about these, um, especially in this um, time um, where we're going to have a whole host of fashion design graduates that um, are very unlikely to be able to secure those jobs within those big brands because they just might not be there anymore um, or people aren't taking on new graduates and they're, you know, skeleton staff. Um, so, you know, perhaps that's where you want to make those communications and those connections as a small brand is with, with those kind of graduates that are looking for a home, looking for somewhere to, to put these fresh skills to use. And there might be a little bit of, you know, training having to happen there, but that's such a worthwhile investment as a small brand is to have that, um, those first people that come on as a startup, um, quite often they will stay a very long time if they feel integral to that brand and they feel like they were one of the first sons, if you see what I mean. So, um, you know, go out and, and literally talent search if you're a small brand, go to those, those, those graduates and, and see them directly because, um, that they'll be looking for that opportunity as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So coming on to my last question, what does the future hold? As a fashion futurist, what does the future hold for fashion? And is it slowing down? Ah, well, I mean, that's the one thing about being a fashion futurist. It's, it's not exactly like I'm Mystic Meg and I, I know what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> part of it is is a lot about being massively obsessed with history. So um, a lot of what I do in terms of trend analytics is looking back at similar situations and seeing what's happened before and seeing the likelihood of that happening again. Um, the one thing that I find really interesting in terms of what does the future hold is taking a little bit of clues from um, the growing consumer groups of millennials and, and Gen Z. So their perspective on ownership for a start is fascinating. Yeah. Um, you know, these, this is the Uber generation, this is the Netflix generation. We do not need to own cars. That's and we do not... To be fair, most of the used guys on, the, on this, this event are all Gen Z. Yeah, good point, actually. <laughs> if anyone defines themselves as a Gen Z or a millennial. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if you are, I mean, there's a lot resting on, on your shoulders. There's a lot of um, yeah. literature out there saying that you guys are, are gonna save our industry. And um, I, can, I can believe it in some ways because um, more than anything, Gen Z are spending money on spirituality, beauty, um, health, uh, well-being, experiences. Um, stuff is, is coming further down on, on the agenda for, for that age group. So um, it, can, it is an interesting point in terms of coming out of this, the new normal um, spending habits, oh, perhaps experience will continue to eat away at the, the actual um, stuff market, you know, actually having fashion and owning it. Um, also, we've, we've seen this massive, um, in, within the same um, demographic, of um, interest in, in luxury and high quality goods. And a lot of that has come from this um, resale market, the fact that you can buy a pair of kicks that will resell for a higher um, RRP than you, you bought from. So that's a really interesting concept where we've seen whole new industries pop up, you know, with stickers for the bottom of your, your Nikes so that you can wear them and, and take pictures of them and, um, but still get full resale value for them being completely clean. Um, those in themselves are complete industries that are popping up around this new interest. So I think that will continue. Um, and I think people, you know, are still going to be uh, looking to, um, to own high quality brands and, and luxury goods and primarily for the focus of reselling them, which again comes back to that point of they don't really own it. They're, they're, they're leasing it for a, a moment in time. They're, you know, if they've thought about their cost per wear of that product after they've taken off what they've sold it for, they might have had a cost for wear that product for five pound a go or something, you know, if they, if they think about it like that. Um, and that's just going to become more normal and things like rental and things like um, uh, peer to peer sharing is something that I think will grow as well. Um, um, and that probably link with a sort of a wider systems change as well of, of 
of businesses being able to um, take that approach. We know from the, the huge funding rounds of people like, um, you know, Rent the, Rent the Runway and um, uh, Reeve on Vare and things like that, that, you know, there is an interest from the finance industry in, in those companies as well. Mm. Yeah, um, and then, I was, I was going to say something, but I can't. Ethan thought. Oh my God, it's gone out of my head. I was going to say something literally off the back of what you were saying. On Gen Z? Were you going in with the demographics? Yeah, Gen Z. So yeah, you've got the whole situation where Gen Z makes up 40% of the global population. Yeah. You know, and they've got massive influence. But also the fact that they um, are no longer brand loyal. So, you know, they're, you know, some of the things that make up the characteristics of Gen Z is they're not brand loyal, yeah. all about price, does it fit with their values and are and you know and they get influenced by their friends so you know it's really important to kind of understand this consumer base and also they have a lot of influence over how the older generations their parents and their grandparents spend their money so if it doesn't align with gen z then they will have a say about you know how their parents and their grandparents are spending their money but also i kind of read um, an article on business of fashion the other day which is around coronavirus and mm -hmm. you know the pandemic and what it and what it means for the luxury industry kind of going forward and you know a lot of a lot of big luxury brands have spent most of their time kicking back on the whole e-commerce kind of side of business you know and they've all been about having big luxury stores and um, we're now in covid and all their shops are shut so it's messed up their supply chains um, but also, you know, um, they've not necessarily engaged with a lot of um, a lot of like the third party um, platforms like Alibaba, JD, Tmall, and big places like, place like that. But one of the things that was quite interesting in the article was, you know, what's going to come out of, of this is that people are not going to be so brand such such brand lovers, so or brand label lovers, where they're walking down the road and they're just literally from head to toe just kitted out in just lots of brands and everybody knows what they're wearing but actually what's going to come out of this whole scenario is possibly a new way of people kind of being a bit more reserved about um the clothing that they wear and not necessarily having a massive label saying this is chanel this is gucci prada or whatever but much more conservative kind of view about fashion which you know for premium and for smaller designers and fashion brands who are just very conservative and very reserved in terms of not splashing the name all over their brands it creates new opportunities for them to kind of enter the market you know and if people are not necessarily focused as much on the brand but much more focused on the quality and the style of the products kind of going forward yeah yeah i think you know that bubble of of brand mania will probably continue continue on for a bit but i think it like you say it will just become distasteful and and there is a history of that when we think about the sort of 2008 um economic collapse you know it that massively made you know if you took probably just a little bit of data on about brand size on a bag probably the decrease of that matched with with the um the health of the economy because people um yeah, it, seen ostentation. yeah yeah absolutely um so I totally agree with that um that it's probably gonna i mean that's the thing it's that unknown of, of, of that could happen or you can get the revenge buying and people wanting to shore up these businesses um outside of it or also trying to you know they've been thirsty for the shop or whatever so mm -hmm. we never know yeah so i think that's kind of us done has anybody got any more questions for us might take a second for anyone to come up with I think we've had a really good amount of questions coming in and out. That was really good. That was a really great, engaging conversation. Um, I hope you guys found it interesting. I know that I did. And judging by a lot of the comments, everyone did as well. So if anyone's got any final questions, otherwise we'll wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you very much, guys, for kind of coming on tonight. This is my first experience of doing a digital event like this, which yes. is nice, actually. Not yeah. having to leave my house and just kind of just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never leave my house these days anyway. But um, but one of the other things I'd just like to say is, you know, um, Fran has very kindly written a bit of a, a, a really good blog post around sustainability, the making sense of sustainability ethics, which you can also find on my website 
and um, I'm going to post it in my stories and there's a link in there's going to be a link in my bio on my um on my profile on Instagram but also if you go to the website it'll be there um as the first blog post so feel free dig in have a read but thank you very much for your time it's been great yeah thank you and thank you for the, the wonderful questions i think yes. it's great to have that kind of um discourse between us thank you definitely keeping us on our toes <laughs> yeah. Some very nice comments coming in everyone saying thank you um so yeah so if anyone would like any further information i'm sure they can get in touch with me i have emailed you all today um so you should have me in your inbox somewhere um my name is amanda if you didn't catch it at the beginning um, but yeah, feel free to get in touch. We're all here to kind of help. Um, so don't be shy. If anything kind of pops into your mind after this, then definitely feel free to share. But thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Bye bye. And we can all go clap now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all go and clap. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>